guys, this is Ro. Welcome back to my channel. So I have a really amazing interview for you guys today. We just did it. It just hung up. I'm going to tell you off the bat, it was a call from prison and it was a prison phone, a typical prison phone where it was staticky. It was kind of difficult to hear. It was even difficult for me who's here in person to hear. I got this brand new expensive ass microphone so, and it's supposed to pick up up to 20 extra decibels so i have it turned all the way up i'm hoping that that helped but just consider yourself warned i know you guys always talk about the quality of the audio when adam calls and sometimes it's difficult for you guys to hear him this is going to be probably 10 times worse unless i can fix it in editing so please know that we do our best but with these from prison calls it's scheduled where I can be ready and in front of my camera and have it ready to go. So I could just hit record when they call, put it on speaker really quick. Cause all we have is the initial, Hey, how are you? Let's get started. And then 15 minutes. And really it's like 14 and a half because by the time that second beep comes, especially if it's somebody that's not Adam, you kind of have to say your goodbyes. So that said, this is Adam, number one closest best friend from when he was in Allenwood. They actually used to have the yard separated. So if you were on one housing unit, you couldn't get to friends on other housing units. So they would have to meet at the fence. Like they would have to plan times to go out to the yard so they could talk to each other through the fence because they were so close, they were like brothers. And Adam has always told me, I call him Daryl. That's his middle name. That's what he goes by. But a lot of people also call him Alan. So for sake of this, we're gonna call him Daryl. He always told me, oh, it broke his heart because Daryl would always have to get ready for parole. Now you guys are probably like, parole. There's no parole in the feds. You're right, except for three types of inmates get parole and everybody else in the federal system, parole is not allowed to them unless you are a military inmate, meaning you're in the military when your case, when you caught your case. Two, your case is out of Washington, D.C. or three, you were sentenced under old law, which is law that before some year in the 80s that I don't remember. So that's how Michael Santos got out. I think he was an old law inmate. So Daryl was in the Marines when he caught his crazy, tragic, should not have even done 26 years case. We're not going to get into the details of that because I want to stick to this being a story of parole. So he's been going in and out, in and out, in and out of parole. Like he said, it's supposed to be every year, but it was a hearing every year and then a clemency hearing, like a naval clemency hearing. It was very odd. He would always just kind of freak email me and be like, we need letters. Can you submit a video? Can you do this? And it was like, drop everything and help me. He would get very, very, very wound tight because that's his one shot. Just like all of you guys that have parole or you have to go to parole hearings and collect letters and all of that stuff, it is almost suffocating. I never went through it with Adam, but I went through it with his best friend, Daryl, and it is suffocating for them. And Adam always told me he's so grateful that he did not have to deal with that and does not have to deal with that because of the highs and the lows and just the anxiety that it causes. And then you work so hard and you get your hopes up and you present this amazing case and then everything's crushed when they turn you down. And it kind of, when he tells this story, he says that the day that he was granted parole, he felt like the way that they were treating him in there, they were cutting him off. They were kind of being very short with him. He's like, it's not going to happen. So he got this a major anxiety. And as he was talking in my head, I was trying not to cut him off because it's hard for me to edit when I cut off people too much, when I, where it's a back and forth conversation. I wanted to say back to him and I'm responding to him right now to you guys is I wanted to say it was probably a better thing that you thought it wasn't coming and you thought this was kind of forget it like a formality and that guy was kind of being rude. And like you said, he could be however he wanted, but it made my anxiety high probably better because you're like, I'm not going to get it. So you're kind of like, Ugh, I'm anxious, but whatever. And then when he finally was granted, it probably was that much better. I remember Daryl had reached out to me early October and I was two days away from leaving for the prisoner family conference. And he was like, I need letters. I need letters. I need letters. And I never had a chance to respond because we give everything in October to the conference. Strong Prison Lives and Families, myself, everything is dedicated to that conference. That's our meetup. I had a keynote there. I was practicing for that, getting ready to travel. I only travel once a year typically. So I didn't respond to him. And then while I was at the conference, I was getting multiple emails a day, like 
well, did you get letters? Can you get letters? Please do me a favor. He calls me sis. Please do me a favor, sis. I need letters. Please do what you could do. Tap your audience, da, 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 da. And I was at the conference. I wasn't even emailing Adam. As you guys know, we got into like a little bit of a tiff about it that I think I recorded a video about that in the past. You could just look back through my channel. But the point is I wasn't emailing Adam. I'm definitely not emailing him back. So then when I got back and things got settled, I totally had forgotten about it. And then I hadn't heard from him for a while. And I was like, oh crap, I hope he's not mad at me. And then the next email I get a couple of weeks later was that he got parole. And I was sitting at my desk at work and I was like, <gasps> like I wanted to cry and scream and jump up and down. And I was so excited. I couldn't even type fast enough to tell Adam that he had gotten parole. Adam was beside himself, like over the moon. It's so exciting when somebody you love is awarded that, especially after watching them suffer for so long. Very similar to the experience that Adam and I had with clemency in 2016 and all of 2017, he said we were recovering. Just wait because you guys are living through this. So when we get our, our water, a watered, when we get a watered, <laughs> so when we get awarded that release, it is going to be you're gonna all be jumping up and down and screaming and crying the way I was for Daryl because you're a family and we're supporting each other and all of that fun stuff. So without wasting any more time, here is my interview with Daryl and please just accept my apology once again for the audio quality. It's just prison phones. Hashtag prison wife life. Let's call from Alan. In Inveda. A federal prison. This call is being recorded and is subject to monitoring. Hang up to decline the call or to accept dial five. Hey. Hello? Can you hear me? Hey, Chris, what you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm great. Are you ready to be YouTube famous? Am I what now? Ready to be YouTube famous? Oh uh, no, I'm kinda of nervous about that. No, don't be nervous. Don't be. Okay. <laughs> okay. You wanna do it? You ready? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background, and then I kind of want to go into what it was like to prepare for parole all of those years, because Adam always told me you would get so wound tight. He always says, he's like, I'm grateful I didn't have to go through what you go through because of how awful it was on, on your psyche, I guess. And then we'll go into kind of leading up to how you were, this one came up out of the blue, and then how, what the feelings are like getting ready to be released after all this time and kind of not prepared for it. Okay. So why don't you start by telling me a little bit about your background and how long you've been in, in and where you are right now and whatever you feel comfortable saying. Okay, well, uh, I was born in Kentucky and uh, joined the Marine Corps uh, right out of high school. was stationed in Hawaii, caught this case, got adjudicated in, uh, I believe, that, December 13th in 1996. So from there, I started off in the military prison, eventually for the USP Leavenworth and then USP Allenwood, where I met Adam. And then Manchester, uh, and then here, as a parole eligible inmate in this system, you have your initial parole hearing, uh, which for me was 10 years, and I, I was convicted with a life sentence, so it's a third year sentence, so uh, anyone who has 45 years or more, you're eligible with a third year more, uh, one third of your eligibility date, which for us is 10 years. Um, Unbeknownst to me, I was under the impression that I would have parole eligibility every year. However, uh, under the old law system, they only give you a review, so they discuss your programming and your behavior and whatnot, or anything's changed in your status. Uh, so, being a military inmate, you have annual clemency hearings, who, while the Department of Justice, the specifically the U.S. Parole Commission, retains jurisdiction on parole, the Navy Clemency Board retains jurisdiction or Senate introduction. So, a little bit like we were talking earlier with Adam, that's how I get wound up. Literally every year, I have uh, an opportunity for a second chance. Uh, if you don't know, you don't have anything to compare that to, you don't know how it's going to go, and that just give you pretty much their decision in written form. Uh, leading up, I was given, I was actually in 2006 while I was at UC Allenwood. I had my initial parole hearing. I was recommended for a parole date by a hearing examiner. But for December of 2018, I had that recommendation in hand for about eight weeks. I talked to the case manager coordinator. He asked me how it went. I told him uh, he's all excited, saying that's, that's going to stick. I, on the other hand, was like, well, I asked him the question. I said, then there's a recommendation. The 
commission general on that. He's like, yeah, Mr. Posovsky, he's the most respected uh, hearing examiner in the region. He doesn't just give anything away. That's probably going to stay. So, long story short, eight weeks later, came back, and uh, the parole commission uh, overturned that decision. So, uh, I had uh, special uh, hearings every two years. I think in 2010, I was given a superior programming award. And what that did, from the commission overturning the recommendation of parole back in 06, they gave me a 15-year set-off, which meant they should really do 15 more years or we'll reconsider you for parole. However, with the Superior Programming Award, it's college from a federal prison. It knocked off some time and moved that reconsideration hearing date to November of uh, 2020. Then in 2012, I transferred to, or 2010, I transferred to Manchester. 2012, I have another interim hearing. I was recommended for another award. They didn't give it to me. Uh, 2000, July of 2012, uh, I transferred here to FMC Lexington uh, as part of the low security custody inmate part of the cadre. And uh, 2013, I had family members who traveled to Washington, D.C. for the military clemency hearing. Uh, one of the parts of getting up and down, like uh, Ro was talking about, uh, the president of the board, Concluding, his concluding remarks was like, you made a very powerful clemency, a very powerful case for clemency for your brother. So when the president of the hearing states that, I have no other reason but to think positive. Uh, well, however, I was denied clemency that year. The following year, I had another statutory in the hearing. I was recommended for another Superior Programming Award. That got turned down. Uh, the same year, same comments from the clemency hearing in D.C., Everything's great, everything's good, and then they turn me down. So, uh, 2016, I have a statutory, and I'm hearing here, I get recommended for a year award for uh, for earning my social degree through Ohio University. Uh, that did stick, so that moved my reconsideration hearing to November of 2019. So this year, uh, basically, well, last year was my last statutory hearing. Uh, Mr. Polchowski, who I had back in 06, who actually gave me the recommendations that both just keep doing what you're doing. So this year, uh, I was anticipating my uh, hearing to be in November at the, at the earliest or later. And then about uh, three weeks prior, I got told that the uh, Parole Commission called this institution and added me on. I uh, didn't really know what to expect about that, didn't know what to anticipate. So, uh, about a week up until the, actually, actually three weeks up until the uh, hearing date, which is October 29th, a case manager tells me that's when it's going to be, says it's going to be the same hearing examiner from last year, uh, which was okay with me because I'd seen Mr. Portolsky two times already. So, a week prior to October 29th, I had listed numerous family and friends to attend the hearing. Uh, policy states that I can have as many people as that I uh, can within reason as long as they don't disturb the hearing. And it's, but it's up to the discretion of the hearing examiner who actually speaks. So I put 10 people on. Part of that was to show support after all these years. And another reason was so I could ensure that people would show up in case conflicting schedule happened at the last moment they couldn't make it. So I get called again, but the case manager said, look, they're only going to approve one person. So I talked to the ADW and uh, the specific CMC, and at the end they relented and would give me four people, which was my uh, my mother, my father, and uh, my sister, and my brother. So they come to the hearing, and uh, the commissioner's there. Oh, actually, as I was talking with Ms. Canaster, the assistant CMC, I, I made the comment, I said, look, uh, if, if Mr. Uh, Wachowski who just came last year, he knows I had multiple people attend. She's like, no, that Canadian's still a commissioner. So I thought that was a little unique and a little odd. I didn't know what to think about that. It changed just a week prior. So I go in there, it's in the visitation room. He calls me in there first. He, uh, he speaks with me. It wasn't going good, according to my first impression, because he kept cutting me off. Uh, it was like, let's discuss your programming just from last year's board. By this time, I earned a bachelor's degree to go with all my other programming. He cuts me off on that and he said, well, let's get something else. 
that she's done in the programming. And uh cuts me off again when he's talking about this, whether or not the, I deserve parole. It's as though I'm going to call your family in. Calls them in, cuts them off. So by this point, you know, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck because he's almost being rude, which I'm, I imagine is his privacy. <laughs> it's not yeah. going good for my nerves. Uh, and out of the blue, he just drops his pen on the desk, uh, which now sounds like a really loud sound, but I'm sure... Let's call it from a federal prison. I'm sure it was just a tap of the pen in the desk, and he said, look, I'm going to give you parole. I've made up my mind. Just nonchalantly, uh, he said, I actually made up my mind on talking to you alone first. And he said, I don't know what there is about you. He says, uh, uh, you've done more programming, programming than anybody I've ever seen. you got a great support network. Something about you, I think you're deserving of a second chance. I'm going to give it to you. And that was it. And uh, he said it was going to be 9 to 12 months. And uh, I said, I should, I should know something in three weeks. In the past, uh, I don't think I've ever been told of a decision within three weeks. It's always been two months or more. But true to his word, 21 days exactly, I found out that uh, I was given a parole date of July 29 of 2020. And a home confinement eligibility date was January 29 of 2020. And my case manager is in the process of putting me in for a halfway house. Uh, so the feelings on that is, uh, I think my head's still stuck in the clouds. It's, it's surreal. Uh, I've been down... Uh, right now, I've been down 23 years and six months, and uh, it really hasn't set in. And I'm, uh, I don't think it will uh, reality will hit until I actually step outside these these doors, these walls. Uh, as far as preparing for something like that, the thing that helped me the most, not just in regards to preparing for parole, but for enduring. Uh, I guess a positive outlook, if, if, if one can have such, in prison is just I always delved into my books, to my studies, and my workouts. And I just took um, each day as what I had scheduled. And, and, that, and, that, and I tried to keep in mind that I could only control what I have control over. Uh, that's kind of cheesy and cliche. Uh, when you focus on the things that you have control over, you know, you can actually worry about what's going to happen with them because you're the one that decides what happens. Uh, as far as worrying about the decisions that's in other people's hands, yeah. it's, it's easier said than done, but you just can't worry about that. You can only be the best today in this moment than you were yesterday. And if you mess up at something today, then just know that tomorrow you can, you've got the chance to be better. That's all you can do. That's amazing. Uh, Where are you paroling to? Say, oh, I am going to be paroling. Well, the halfway house, it looks like, in the region that I'll go is Louisville. But I'll be living in Adair County, Kentucky. That's where my mother and father are living. It's a small town, uh, probably about an hour and 20 minutes south east of Louisville. And, you know, they've stuck with me all these, all these years, and uh, uh, it's just, you know, they're getting older, and, you know, I owe it to them to go and be with them. So I don't know how much longer they're going to be around. Of course. And just, just help with the house and just, you know, be there. I'm kind of getting pulled in two different directions, not in a, in a nefarious way or anything, but my, I was discussing my brother who attended the hearing. I'm adopted. was adopted when I was a child. By the handles, I guess their name's sake. But my brother Rob, he and I share the same father. So he found me in, I think, 2011 when I was in Manchester, and after being separated for 30 something years. So uh, while I live with my parents, you know, probably every other weekend, Rob and his family, his son was given the middle name of my name, so that's kind of cool. Oh, I'm going to cry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so they're all excited. So eventually, I'll, I'll probably end up Louisville because there's more career opportunities for me. But right away, it's going to be in a small south 
Eastern town in Kentucky. So. I, I think that's probably perfect for you coming out of where you've been for so long. So really quick before we run out of time, talk to me about the anxieties that you feel. I know you said you're still kind of in the clouds and it's kind of surreal at this point, but is there any kind of fear or anxiety? I can only imagine after 23 and a half years that there has to be. Um, well, I guess the anxiety that I have would be just from not knowing what to expect. Yeah. As far, you know, there's so many things that change with technology and what jobs are going to be available and uh, the barriers and the, uh, it, the lack of interpersonal skills that I may or may not have. And there was the beat. So, I um, um, you want me to call back at another time or this or? Yeah, sure. If you want, Adam's going to call at 7.30. So I don't know is, I don't know if there's enough time for you to wait the half hour and then call back and not cut into that. But maybe... Whenever it's easy for you. Whenever it's easy for you. We can, we can reschedule this next week. Perfect. Next weekend, whatever. Yeah, let's email. Just okay, just email me and let me know, okay? Perfect. Wait, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited for you and love you. Oh, man, listen, anything for you. Look, oh. you know Adam, man, I miss him, and I can't wait to meet you, and gosh, he's next, you're next. You're next Absolutely. Next, right? Yeah, of course. Hey, I love, I love you. Just email me, and we'll schedule it, okay? Sounds good, okay. Okay, bye. Bye. Oh, what a doll. So we're going to do a part two of this so he can finish. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart and Daryl's heart and Adam's heart to all of yours. Don't forget to subscribe. By the way, if you're not already subscribed, we're trying to reach 10,000 subscribers in 2019 and as of today when i'm filming this we are 320 subscriber subscribers <laughs> subscribers away so it would mean the world to me if you would just hit that subscribe button and if you like this content that would be great if you could just give this video a thumbs up free way that you can help me out i love you guys and i will see you in the next one bye